that if there's a gradient in concentration in a situation where we're looking at distance scales which are long compared to the mean free path of a particle moving in some material or fluid or substrate that the motion is diffusive, the particle makes a kind of random walk. Its direction of motion gets um, renewed for some characteristic time scale during which it travels a characteristic length scale. That's the mean free path. And then there will be a flux according to the diffusion law proportional to the gradient of the concentration of the particle. The concentration tends to flow from regions of high concentration to regions of low concentration for purely statistical reasons. And the constant appearing in the equation is called the diffusion constant or diffusivity. Using the continuity equation, the fact that the particles are conserved, we can write down a partial differential equation govern governing the concentration and says that the concentration regarded as a function of position and time has a time derivative, which is given by D times gradient square of concentration. That's the diffusion equation. We discussed last time how the diffusion equation can be derived or interpreted from a microscopic viewpoint. In fact, we can think of it as an equation which governs the probability distribution for particles in the system. So, Keep things simple. Suppose we have a one-dimensional system, and we think of the particles as making a random walk. There's some characteristic time for the direction of motion to be reset. I'll call that epsilon, the time step. Or if you like, the reset time. And we can imagine describing the motion on a lattice with equally spaced sites with spacing between the sites which I'll call delta. And in each time step, the particle will take a step either to the neighboring site on the right or the neighboring site on the left, each occurring with a probability And then we saw that if we consider a probability distribution which is broad on the scale of the lattice space, which changes slowly as a function of position on the scale of the lattice space, then in each time step, the probability distribution will be updated slightly. We can describe that as a form of which the lattice spacing delta and the time step epsilon go to zero, and then I'll maintain the probability distribution for, in this case, I'm in one dimension, so I have a probability distribution for the position in one dimension, which is the integer times the last space in delta, and the time in our discretized model is some integer multiple of epsilon. But if we take the formal limit in which the steps are small, we obtain a differential equation, which is just the diffusion equation satisfied by the probability distribution. The time derivative of the probability distribution at a particular site is given by diffusion equation in the case where in just one dimension, so it's the second partial derivative with respect to x of this function of x and t, and we also learn that we can express the diffusion equation in terms of the parameters 
in our discrete times model, the diffusion equation is the lattice spacing delta squared divided by twice the time. So when we take the limit of a very broad distribution, or equivalently a small lattice space, and we take the limit of the e fixed in order to get the situation that's described by the diffusion equation microscopically. And if you like, you can think of this as being one half times a speed of motion. The particle hops left or right by distance delta in the time epsilon, so it moves at a speed delta over epsilon, uh, times a characteristic mean free path. So V is the speed, and you can think of delta as the mean free path. In other words, it's the distance the particle travels before getting its direction motion randomized. We saw that if you have an initial probability distribution at time zero, which is just a delta function of position, so the particle starts out at the origin with probability one, then after a time t, the probability distribution will give, be given by a Gaussian, one over the square root of four pi dt, the exponential of minus x squared over four dt, so the width of that Gaussian depends on the time. And you can think of this as it's really mathematically equivalent to the problem we discussed a long time ago of an unbiased coin flipped many times. The flip of the coin corresponds to whether the particle decides to go left or right. And the position after t steps is the excess of steps to the right over steps to the left. So it's just like our distribution for the uh, spin excess in our simple model of the magnet we discussed in the first week of the class. We look at the mean, well, root mean squared distance as the particle travels in the time t. It grows like the square root of the time with the diffusion constant uh, soaking up the dimensions, turning uh, the square root of time into a distance. That's characteristic of diffusive motion. That the distance travel goes like the square root of the time. We can consider the three-dimensional situation, and it's really the same thing. We can imagine the particle now taking a random walk in which its uh, direction of motion gets randomized, and we can describe that on the lattice. So in effect, it's making independent random walks in the x, y, and z directions. On three dimensions, you can think of the diffusion constant as essentially the same thing as except, well, I'll use D for the dimensionality for three dimensions of the three dimensions of two times two, one over six, squared over epsilon. But the idea is just that if you consider a cubic lattice in three dimensions, uh, there are six directions in which you can step in each time step. You can either go up or down, left or right, or forward or back. And so the probability distribution will have a vector of one six of it instead of one half, because there are six ways you can go, which are all equal probable. And our expression, if we start out with probability one of being at the origin a delta function in three dimensions, <coughs> time t, uh, we'll have a probability distribution um, for the three dimensional position which is just the product of this distribution three times governing the x, y, and z displacement. So we're interested in the excess of steps up versus steps down, steps left versus steps right, and steps forward versus steps back. So it would be 1 over 4 of pi dt to the 3 halves, and then the exponential, well, e to the minus vector x squared, so x squared plus y squared plus z squared divided by 4 dt. And that would solve the three-dimensional version of the diffusion equation in which this second derivative becomes the gradient squared for points of x, y, z, and t. So in three dimensions, if I consider uh, the t 
typical distance travel, now we add up the distance travel in the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction, that is, we, we add up uh, the squares, there's contribution to the mean value of x squared. It's just the mean value of x squared, the mean value of y squared, and the mean value of z squared. So the mean values all grow like 2 dt, and they add up. So if I take the square root, I'll now have the square root of 6 dt. So again, the distance from the origin grows like the square root of the time, and the coefficient of that square root of time is determined by the diffusion constant. So what Einstein realized back in 1905 is that we can use this picture of a random walk to understand ground motion. Uh, uncharacteristically, the Brownian motion is aptly named because it was discovered by Brown. And he, in the early 19th century, was looking at a pollen grain suspended in water under an optical microscope. The pollen grain is about a micron in size, and he noticed that it dances around. And makes kind of a crazy walk. And if you wait a minute or so, it'll typically move about six microns, about six times uh, its radius. And uh, I think, I'm not sure whether Brown observed, but others had, or Einstein, that the distance traveled goes like the square root of the time. Brown thought that, uh, well, maybe the pollen grains are alive and they're swimming. But Einstein had a very different picture, which is that this poor little pollen grain is being pummeled from all sides by random collisions with molecules, which make it dance around. Yeah. So at any given time, it's being, because of fluctuations, hit a little bit harder from the left than from the right, and from up than from down, and forward and back. And so it executes this random walk in three dimensions cause of fluctuations. And he um, gave us, well, something like this derivation of the diffusion equation from a microscopic point of view. And we also did another important thing, which he explained what the diffusion constant was in terms of other, uh, in principle, measurable quantities, called the Einstein relation. which is diffusion constant is equal to uh, temperature times something called the mobility. Mobility, or really it's reciprocal, is a measure of dissipation, how much friction is encountered by a particle which is moving through the fluid. So if we think of, say, our little pollen grain of falling under the force of gravity through the water or whatever it is, um, there will be resistance to that applied force coming from the, in this case, the viscosity of the fluid, the fact that the fluid uh, resists flow, and as a result, the particle will reach a terminal velocity, which is proportional to the force. And what that means is that the uh, frictional force impeding the motion of the particle is balancing the force applied to the particle when it reaches the terminal velocity, which is proportional to the force, and the constant of proportionality is B. So the larger B is, the less resistance there is, the less dissipation. Small mobility means high dissipation, low terminal velocity. Um, Okay, so where does this relation come from? I'll describe 
two ways to derive it or understand it. So the first is, we can imagine a steady state situation where there's a force being applied to the particle. And let's say there are uh, many particles in our fluid, and they're all bouncing around because of the fluctuation. And we'll reach a steady state where the diffusive flow, because there's a gradient in density, is exactly opposed by the terminal drift of the particles. So in other words, if we have a gradient, it's more dense here, and less and less dense as you go up, then because of the high density, diffusion will make the density you want to spread upward. And in the steady state, that will be exactly opposed by uh, the drift of the particles their terminal motion in which the um, dissipation matches the applied force. So in the total flux, in the state of A is equal to zero, there are two contributions to that flux. There is the diffusive contribution uh, this law of diffusion, that there's a flux proportional to minus the gradient of concentration. And there's the contribution, which is just concentration times uh, drift velocity, which is what flux would be if there were no diffusive contribution. So this is, uh, if you like, the drift flux. And this is the uh, diffusive flux. Once we reach an equilibrium situation, they add up to zero, they're equal and opposite. Now, when we're in equilibrium, then the distribution of particles in the fluid should be given by a Boltzmann distribution for any closure with a reservoir at some specified temperature. Concentration uh, proportional to ultimate factor associated with the conservative potential that um, produces the force. In other words, the force being applied to the particles is minus gradient of this potential. And in equilibrium, the probability of a particle being in a position should be proportional to the Boltzmann factor of the energy being determined by the potential. So that means if I take the gradient of the concentration, I differentiate this exponential, so I get a minus gradient of potential divided by temperature times concentration. And that's just equal to force uh, divided by temperature times concentration. So we know That in equilibrium, since the two contributions to the flux are the same, I have diffusion constant times gradient of potential uh, equals concentration times uh, velocity. But this is just uh, diffusion constant times force divided by temperature times concentration. And this is, since the terminal velocity is just mobility times force, equal to mv times force. So the concentration and the force drop out of the equation. And the conclusion is that the diffusion constant divided by temperature is equal to 
mobility. That's the Einstein equation. But let's uh, try to understand what's going on from a microscopic point of view. Like I said, these particles are actually, why are they moving around? Infusively, it's because they're being hit by molecular collisions. There's a force being applied. Think of the particle as moving a little ways freely until the collision randomizes its motion. And during that time, it will accelerate a little bit. The acceleration will just be given by the force divided by the mass. M is the mass of the drifting particle, not of the molecules. No. <coughs> and so, there's going to be a reset time. in the microscopic model we discussed last time, we'll call that epsilon. That's the time that the particle moves before the molecular collision to randomize its velocity and send it off in a new direction. Uh, time for velocity to be reset. acceleration applied for that time is going to allow the particle to attain a component of its velocity in the direction of the force, which is the acceleration times the time, a epsilon. Actually, its average speed during the acceleration will be half that. If we imagine it started out with no contribution to its speed coming from the acceleration, starting at zero velocity, winding up at velocity a epsilon, the uh, average of C due to the acceleration due to the force is going to uh, be uh, the average equals one half the acceleration times the reset time or one half f over m. Uh, times epsilon. And so that means I can think of this as mobility times f, and we can identify the mobility as one half of epsilon over m. Now suppose we use the model in which the diffusion constant um, in terms of the reset time and the mean free path in d dimensions can be the uh, you know the, the step the spatial step size the distance the particle goes before its velocity gets reset divided by two d times the reset time. What I said over here. So I'd like you. I'd like to invite you to think of that as one over two uh, d times the square of the speed for the particle times the reset time. So this now, I'll call it capital D squared. It's the speed squared for our diffusing particle. So that means, since this is uh, b squared over 2d epsilon, I can write epsilon in terms of the diffusion concept. Epsilon is equal to 2d, the dimension, times big D diffusion constant, uh, divided by the speed squared. Okay? So what's the mobility? Again, remember the mobility. We said would be one half 
uh, epsilon divided by the mass of the drifting particle. But now let's put in this expression for the um, reset time epsilon in terms of the fusion constant. So then we have spatial dimension times the fusion constant divided by m of v squared. So now, let's make the following leap. Before, when we talked about the equal partition principle, we imagined applying it to the motion of the molecules themselves, since there would be a kinetic energy of one half tau in each quadratic degree of freedom for the molecules in the gas. We can also apply equal partition to the kinetic energy of our drifting particle. Okay. <coughs> so in thermal equilibrium, I can say that because of equal partition, the kinetic energy, one half uh, mv squared, mean value, for the drifting particle will, if we're in d spatial dimensions, there will be a one half tau because of equal partition for each one of the components of its velocity in the dimension. So in other words, for mv squared, uh, I can take d tau by equal partition in classical statistical mechanics and substituting that into the right expression for the mobility. Uh, we get the Einstein relation again, the fusion constant divided by tau. But this argument is a little more crude than the one I gave initially, which is a bit more uh, respectable. We happen to get exactly the same answer. If we'd gotten the same answer up to some constant like 2 or pi, I wouldn't have been too disturbed about it. But we can see that why it makes sense for the mobility to go like the fusion constant divided by tau. From the point of view of the microscopic model, if we think of the diffusing particle as having a kinetic energy set by equal partition. Yeah. How did he drop the brackets? When yeah, well, so I'm saying that we're watching the particle over some long time compared to you know the typical fluctuations in the speed. And so if I want uh, the mobility, the particle actually is, uh, you know, its speed is fluctuating. But we're interested in its average trip speed with those fluctuations averaged down. And so I'm just going to take the average kinetic energy of the diffusing particle in this estimate. Okay. So that's the Einstein relation again. So the way Einstein used this was kind of interesting. He used it to estimate Avogadro's number, which was a big deal at the time, because there were various people using various points of view, trying to estimate Avogadro's number and get a better understanding of whether they should believe in the reality of atoms. So as we've seen, what the diffusion equation tells us is that if I look at the mean square distance traveled by a particle, let's say now in three dimensions, that if I divide that by the time, I get six times the diffusion constant. And the Einstein relation tells us how to express the diffusion constant in terms of the temperature and the mobility. And uncharacteristically, I'll write in Boltzmann's constant for a reason we'll see in a minute. For tau, it's actually kT times mobility. But Einstein knew what the mobility is of a sphere suspended in water because there was a formula that Stokes had to run, which I won't really explain because it requires explaining what viscosity is, which is a whole lecture in itself. But according to Stokes, if I consider a sphere moving through a fluid which has some viscosity or resistance to flow, eta, then the mobility can be written as 1 over 6 pi viscosity times r, which is the radius 
of the sphere. Okay. So bigger sphere means uh, it's harder to push the ball through the fluid because of the viscosity and therefore smaller mobility. And from looking in the microscope, Brown knew, or others knew by that time, about how big the pollen grain is, that it's about a micron in size, and the viscosity of uh, water was also known from other measurements. So the mobility was known. What was not known so well at the time was Boltzmann's constant. So Einstein used this to derive a value of Boltzmann's constant. And you can translate that into a statement about Avogadro's number because the Avogadro number is an uh, ideal gas constant <coughs> R divided by Kb, that is the Boltzmann constant. If you write uh, pressure times volume not as uh, n tau like you usually do, but as n uh, rt, um, where now n is the number of particles in moles, I don't know if n's n, uh, well, the constant r was now, and r is just n, uh, the number of particles in a mole, times Boltzmann's constant. So it determined Boltzmann's constant, and hence out of God for his number. Yeah. How did he manage to get the value of capital D? Capital D? Yeah. Yeah, he got it from the Einstein uh, relation. He knew that it was the temperature in units of energy, which is Boltzmann's constant times the temperature in degrees Kelvin. But he didn't know Boltzmann's constant. Yeah, that's right. He used this to find Boltzmann. Oh, how did he? Okay, right. He, used it, he, he did this. He said, okay, here's a particle. And it has a size of about uh, r equals 1 micron, or micrometer. And look at it under a microscope. You, it's big enough so you can see it with a good optical microscope. And it jiggles around. And then you can, with a stopwatch, verify that the distance it typically travels uh, scales like the square root of the time, or distance squared scales like t, and with a constant of proportionality, which you can then determine by looking at how far it goes. And that's how 6d can be extracted from the data. If you put in the viscosity of water in R equals um, a micron, then uh, the typical distance traveled is about 6 microns in a minute. You don't have to walk, you, know, you look at the particle moving around for a few minutes and you do it many times, and you can get a pretty good estimate of this expected value of x squared. And that means you know d from observing the diffusing particle. And then Einstein had derived that d is kt times b, no, b was known, and so kb was determined. And so the Rogers number was determined, and he got 6 times 10 to the 23. But in this case, it seemed like that determination of Avogadro's number was especially compelling evidence for the reality of atoms, because Einstein understood, I don't know, should I do it again, that the interpretation was that the pollen grain was getting hit from all sides, <laughs> and the ground was out of it by all these molecular collisions, and that's why it was drifting around. It was a controversial subject in the early 20th century whether atoms uh, were real. The philosophically minded uh, questioned it, like Locke, because he said, well, you can never see them. You know, it's just a theory. And well, now we have lots of ways of seeing them. But this was a, the first hint that you really could see them because the jiggling around of the pollen grain was evidence of the uh, pollen grain being subject to molecular fluctuation. So this um, Einstein relation
was one of the first examples of something that's called a fluctuation dissipation relation. Diffusion constant equals mobility times temperature. Um, some connection between these two things. Mobility has to do with dissipation, the resistance to flow for the particle, the particle going through the fluid. Actually, the um, reciprocal of the mobility is a measure of dissipation. High mobility means low dissipation. So this is a measure of dissipation. And we uh, see from the interpretation of diffusion in terms of a random walk, or because of uh, this behavior, which you can observe when a particle is suspended in a uh, uh, diffusive medium, that the diffusion constant is a kind of measure of fluctuations. How once the particle is walking around with random, that's what I mean by a fluctuation. And there's a relationship between the two things, and it involves the temperature. So if you fix the dissipation, in this case the mobility, then as you crank up the temperature, the fluctuations get stronger and stronger, coming, um, arising because of the molecular collision, pummeling the poor pollen grain harder and harder. We talked about another fluctuation dissipation relation. Does anybody remember that? It was a while ago. Maybe this will remind you. So we can think of it this way that there's some power being dissipated by the motion of the particle. Oh, that gave it away. Johnson noise. Johnson noise, right. In other words, the power. or particle that's shaking around is like a force times speed, and if you think of the speed as being the terminal velocity, uh, v squared uh, divided by the mobility, according to definition of mobility, and so if I look at the mean square distance traveled by a refusing particle, and divide by t squared. So this is like v squared over b, so it's something like the power being dissipated by the diffusing particle subject to the force. And uh, it's well in, in d spatial dimensions, it would actually be equal to uh, 2d times the temperature times 1 over t. So you can think of T as a characteristic time over which you're watching the motion of the particle, and the 1 over T is kind of like a, a frequency thing. So this is analogous to the case of Johnson noise. Which according to Nyquist's formula, the power is I squared R. And that's four times the temperature times the frequency band in which we're watching the fluctuations of the current or the voltage. Okay, so if you like some characteristic time of observation for the fluctuating current. So in both cases, the temperature controls the scale of the fluctuations. There's something that measures dissipation. Here it's R, the resistance in circuit. Here it's one over B. 1 over B is a measure of the dissipation for the particle moving through the fluid. And um, the size of the fluctuations scales with the temperature. Okay? Higher temperature, larger fluctuations. That's a fluctuation dissipation relation. So tau controls the size of fluctuations.
So there's one other topic I guess I'd like to talk about for 40 minutes or so. Before I do that, let me remind you, in case I forget to do so at the end of the class, that there's a final exam. <laughs> I expect to post it today. It will be due at the end of the exam period, which is 5 p.m. Friday. similar to the midterm, the rules are the same. It'll be four hours this time. Uh, uh, you can take a 15 minute break that doesn't count sometime during the four hours. Uh, and um, there will be four questions. So it's a lot like Passover, four questions, four hours. And um, what are the questions about? You know, the uh, content of the courses, um, fair game. But the course is kind of cumulative, so chances are, if I were writing this exam, I did, that I would draw more heavily from uh, some of the latter topics. What were those? It seems to me that we talked about phase transitions quite a bit. <laughs> And wasn't there something that he mentions? <laughs> and things like the Bose Einstein and fairly direct distributions and quantum gases and things like that. And everything else. <laughs> Uh, sorry? What about kinetic, kinetic theory? Oh yeah, good point. That's exactly right. And kinetic theory. I'm glad you reminded me. I forgot uh, Einstein. And, um, oh yeah, and I'd appreciate it if uh, you're willing to. If you'll fill out the, uh, the TQFR uh, questionnaire. It helps me. And I guess you get an email telling you how to do that. Um, I got some feedback from that survey that you did earlier. And there are two main things I learned. Actually, I want to see if among uh, you, my biggest fans who are actually here, if there's a consensus about these things. One is the homework. Uh, some people don't like the problems in K and K very much. They like it better when I write the problems. So if you uh, suppose you know other things being equal, you can do a KK problem or a JP problem. How many like KK problems better? You know they kind of tell you the formula. How many like the problems I write better? Um, okay, so that's uh, <laughs> uh, consistent with the uh, results of the survey. Biggest complaint about the lectures surprises me. My monotone voice. <laughs> I need to modulate my voice more. <laughs> How many would like me to modulate my voice more? Uh, more? <laughs> Less? <laughs> modulate my voice more. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, modulate my voice less. <laughs> about, about the way I'm doing it. Oh, okay, so it's something or something I'm here. I don't know. All right. So I'll practice the modulation and the rest of the lecture. And uh, what I want to talk about it is um, <laughs> Maxwell's demon. <laughs> Four hours when you're actually sitting yeah, yeah. 
of working, writing, and 15 minutes where you go to the bathroom or have a snack or something like that. Four hours and 15 minutes from start to finish. Okay. Um, I mean, okay. So, uh, let's talk about Maxwell Steam and the second law. <laughs> So, of course, the foundations of thermodynamics, the, the fun of this course has been to see how we can recover thermodynamics from a microscopic point of view. And really, the germ of that idea uh, arose in the 19th century, particularly because of the work of Boltzmann and Maxwell, names you've heard a lot. But Maxwell had some qualms about the microscopic view of the second law of thermodynamics, which he expressed in an article in 1871, which he called Limitations of the Second Law. Maybe it doesn't always work, he said. Can you imagine the following situation? Suppose I have gas in a box. One of our favorite things to consider. And suppose the box is divided into two parts. There's a partition in the middle, I'll call the part to the left of the partition A and the part to the right of the partition B. And there's a little door I can open and shut. When a molecule is heading towards the door, I can open the door and let it pass, or I can close the door and it bounces off the door and doesn't pass. So, uh, since you probably don't believe that I can do that, Maxwell said imagine a demon with great uh, observational power who can watch every single one of the molecules in the gas. At all times, he's watching where they go. And uh, for the purpose of this discussion, we can think of the dynamics as being completely classical. Okay? So, there, uh, if you really can know exactly what in principle, you can know exactly what the position and the speed, the velocity is of every molecule, and that's what the demon knows. And he allows any molecules that are going faster than me, there's a Maxwell distribution of velocities, right? Some are going faster, some are going slow in equilibrium. And uh, so when he sees fast molecules heading towards the door, he allows them to pass if they're going from A to B. But if they're trying to go from B to A, he doesn't let the fast molecules through. He does let slow molecules through, though. So the molecules that have a kinetic energy Less than the typical kinetic energy are allowed to pass from B to A. The ones with kinetic energy greater than the typical kinetic energy pass from A to B. And the demon keeps doing this for a long time. And what happens? Well, A is going to cool down. And B is going to heat up. So we started out with all the gas and the molecule at the same temperature, governed by a single uh, Maxwell distribution. But after a while, A is cooler, B is warmer. But as far as uh, one can discern, there's no reason in principle why the demon couldn't do this expending a negligible amount of work. He's only got to move this little tiny hatch open and shut to let one molecule through. It doesn't sound very hard. Okay, and with the, he's a very powerful demon, an excellent engineer, and he manages to make a very efficient little door. Does them all go through? He's watching them all the time, and that you know requires a very vigilant demon who doesn't necessarily watch things. Look, I'm watching you. Am I working? No. So is that clear that he has to expend more than an average amount of work? So the work is negligible, or could be. Yet, one side cools off, the other heats up. That violates the second law. If there's no dissipation, because the entropy of the universe is going down. Okay. 
And in fact, if I'm eager to you know, uh, lower my dependence on imported oil, I can do this for a while, and I'm running a refrigerator, and then I can let the heat flow from the warmer side to the cooler side and operate a heat engine you know, from my laptop. Okay. So that doesn't, something seems wrong here, and Maxwell knew there was something fishy about this, but uh, he was, couldn't quite put his finger on what was wrong with it. So it seems like, under these circumstances at least, Second law of thermodynamics can be violated. Granted, it requires a fairly advanced civilization maybe to carry out this program. But some of the years from now, maybe we'll be able to do it. And therefore, everything I've told you through the years, you know, it's all garbage. Second law is wrong. Yes. Wait, what's your argument for the work is invisible here? Well, I guess that's what we want to examine more closely. Right? We'd like to understand whether what are the real limitations on carrying out this procedure. No, but what was what, what your question? Are you looking for the work is negligible? Why did I say the work was negligible? Because first of all, uh, observing the position and uh, momentum of all the molecules, it's not clear. Uh, something we should think about, right? Whether that requires significant expenditure of energy, I'm just watching, okay? And secondly, I have to operate the little door. How do you make the slower? How do you make only the slower? You just wait until one's coming. Oh, yeah, right. So, I'm, so they're bouncing around, right? So every once in a while, if I keep the door closed, they're going to bounce where the door is. Okay, and instead of letting them bounce, well, I either let them bounce if, uh, you know, from coming from one side they're too hot, or coming from the other side they fall. Oh. Yeah, okay. Otherwise, I let them through. Okay. You said the move off the board. So that's going to cause some flow of heat from one side to the other, right? One side will get hotter, the other side will get colder. Second law says you shouldn't be able to do that without expending some work. The question is, why is there some unavoidable expenditure of work in this process if indeed there is? That was the question that Maxwell raised, but did not resolve. And some years later, quite a few years later actually, Leo Szilard took up the question. This was just a few years before he became technically the first person to conceive of a nuclear chain reaction. And he uh, thought about Maxwell's proposal. And he made several, a number of important conceptual contributions in this paper. For one thing, he for the first time suggested a kind of connection between entropy and thermodynamics and information. Because he seemed to feel that it was very important in doing our entropy accounting to think about the demon himself and how his thermodynamic state might be changing might be changing because the demon is acquiring information when it observes the state of the molecular gas. That was an idea which, uh, 20 years later, was taken much further by Shannon, who founded modern information theory in 1948. He also, apparently, was the first person to think of the concept of a bit, that we can express information in terms of two-level systems, he didn't call them bits, but he had the idea. And the idea that we could quantify information by how many bits we need to record the information, how many uh, letters we can get from values. And so Szilard said, well, it's helpful to think about Maxwell's idea in concrete terms. Let's make it as simple as possible. Always a good thing to do when you're a physicist. I am coming boil down the idea to a simplest realization that you have the best chance of understanding.
So he focused on the question, what is it that really is irreversible that's going on here? He noted that the demon is going to have to measure. He wondered, is there some dissipation associated with the demon acquiring information? He noted that the demon was going to have to store information in the memory. And he wondered about whether that involved some kind of irreversibility. And he was a little bit cagier when it came to this last one. But he also uh, seemed to realize that the demon will need to reset himself, which means that information will have to be erased. And he tried to put his finger on what the catch was, why, in fact, the total entropy of the universe maybe isn't going down if we analyze this process carefully enough. Now, here's a version of the demon machine that he envisioned. He said, it's gas in a box. What's the simplest gas? What's the simplest gas? Molecule. Mm -hmm. Yes, but even simpler would be just one molecule. Okay. Zero molecules wouldn't do, but one molecule, we can talk about a gas. Now, of course, if we want to do statistical mechanics, we want to have many molecules. But Solari said, well, OK, we can consider many one molecule gases in statistical uh, mechanics to that ensemble. Well, let's just look at one molecule at a time. So there's a box, and there's a molecule in it, and it's bouncing around. It's in contact with the reservoir. The reservoir is at temperature tau. So we're going to consider isothermal processes at temperature tau. And here's how we'll try to get some useful work um, without, um, well, useful work for free, essentially, which would lower the entropy of the universe. So there will be four steps. The first step is we will start out with a box which has no partition. There's a molecule in there somewhere. And then we will suddenly close the door, partitioning the box into two parts, the left part and the right part. And when we do so, we will capture the molecule in either the right side or the left side, the two occurring essentially equal, probably. But we'll catch it on one side or the other. Okay. That's the first step. And we um, partition into two parts. But we haven't at this stage observed whether we caught the particle on the right side or the second side. So the second step is to measure. So the demon learns whether the molecule got caught on the left or the right. Which of the two possibilities is it? Is it stuck on the right side or on the left side? So now we know. Let's say we found out that it's on the right side. So then what I'll do is I will allow the partition to move. I've got a molecule that's on the right side it's bouncing around off the wall. And I'll load this now movable partition with the weight. There's a little rope going around the pulley. And the weight. Um, actually, I, um, yeah, I guess that's right. So I load the thing. And now I quasi-statically allow the gas to expand. It's going to be bouncing around. It's going to kick uh, the movable wall every once in a while. And it's going to slowly move the wall to the left, clicking away. Okay? So the third step will be isothermal expansion.
wall is moved all the way to the, to the left side. Okay. And now we have no wall, and we have a single molecule bouncing around inside the unpartitioned box. Yes? How do we know it will expand all the way that way? How do we know it won't just come to equilibrium like... There's no part of the other. Well, it's an isothermal process, oh. so it won't actually lose energy. It'll stay in uh, contact with the reservoir of temperature T, so it'll keep bumping into the wall and pushing it into the wall. Okay. So you took the energy to raise the weight out of the reservoir? Sorry? So you took the energy to raise lift the weight out of the reservoir? The, well, the weight itself, it doesn't really have to be in contact with the reservoir, but the energy to lift the weight is coming from the reservoir, so that the molecule is doing work of lifting the weight, Where's the energy coming from? It's coming from the reservoir, because the molecule will stay in thermal equilibrium with the reservoir temperature tau. But in order to stay isothermal while it keeps pushing the weight, it has to acquire energy from the reservoir. So the total amount of work that's going to be done I'm going to put the case in for it. Time being, Boltzmann's constant times a temperature times a log two. This is actually a reversible isothermal process of the sort that we talked about before. It just happens to be just one molecule. So before we said that when the expansion occurs at constant temperature, that the entropy increases by so this is now the conventional entropy, so I should put in a factor of K, Boltzmann's constant, times the log of the final volume after expansion divided by the initial volume before expansion. I guess I didn't explicitly say so, but I was imagining that I put the partition right in the middle. So when the wall gets pushed all the way to the left side, the volume has doubled. So the entropy, in this case, when n is equal to 1, and the ratio of the final volume to the initial volume is 2. Uh, the entropy uh, increase is um, just k log 2. And the amount of work done isothermally, then, is kt log 2. The work, according to the first law, is just the temperature times the change in entropy. So there's heat flowing from the reservoir into our one molecule gas, and that heat is doing the work. Okay? We lifted the weight, but there was no waste heat. Okay? We did this at temperature tau. We had a reservoir temperature tau. We had no zero temperature reservoir. We didn't have to produce any uh, waste heat. So no waste heat. We only had one temperature, one reservoir, temperature tau. We were able to steal a kT log 2 of energy from the reservoir and do useful work with it. So we did work, and the entropy of the whole world Um, don't forget about the entropy of the whole world. The number of states of the gas expanded by a factor of two, so the entropy of the gas increased, and that increase in entropy we were able to use to do useful work without any waste heat, and that violates the second law. This is better than Carnot efficiency. We had no cold reservoir, but we could do work. We just threw it right out of the reservoir of temperature tau. And then the fourth step is we start the whole thing over again and do it again. So we can keep doing it over and over again. Each time we get work out, kT log 2, about half the time the molecule, when we measure it in step 2, is going to be on the left, half the time on the right. We use that information to know which way to load the movable wall. Okay, so the weight will always be lifted. But every time we do kT log 2 until uh, you know, 
I'm tired of using my laptop. Well, the reason I emphasize that we can repeat this is because, like in our analysis of a heat engine, we wanted to consider a cycle that we could repeat over and over and over again. So we wanted to come back to the initial situation, so everything would be the same, again, and then run the cycle again. It seems like I can do that here, right? Um, I started out with a molecule in the unpartitioned box, partitioned it, I let the um, gas expand, and then I'm back to a molecule in an unpartitioned box, so I can do the thing over here. Oh, we should always ask, when confronted with a heat engine or refrigerator that seems to do paradoxical things, is, is this cycle really closed? Oh, is everything the same? At the end of the cycle is when we can, or has something changed that we need to keep track of when we run the cycle over and over again? Okay. Well, let's think about the demon himself or herself. The, uh, Is the demon in a different situation, a different state at the end of the cycle than at the beginning? Yes. How so? At the beginning, he doesn't. Well, at the beginning, there's uncertainty in which half the, uh, the, the molecule is, but at the end, there's uh, 100% certainty that it is. Yes, he has recorded some information. The demon. No. Because. Demon has stored information. In his memory. He had to store it, right? He made the measurement to figure out whether the molecule was on the left or the right. He wrote that down. Then he was able to figure out how to load the wall during the isothermal expansion. What he stored was one bit. Whether it was left or right when he measured it. Okay. So really, the system that we're considering is not just the gas, the one molecule in the box. It is one molecule in the box and the demon's memory. Okay. We brought the gas back to its original state, but not the body. Now, the demon might have a lot of memory, and if he has a finite amount of memory, eventually he's going to use it up, and he won't be able to do this anymore. He won't be able to store another bit, unless he does what? Right. So, the demon, memory is limited. He must eventually erase. Everyone's going to use them. If he doesn't, uh, if he just stops after he runs out of memory, well, then we have to remember that the memory itself is, well, we have to ask how we should model that. If it's really a perfect memory, it doesn't have any fluctuations, it is a zero temperature reservoir. It's a system of zero temperature. So we shouldn't be so shocked that the demon was able to get some useful work out because he had a low temperature reservoir. That was his memory itself. Okay. So if we want him to keep doing this over and over again, and he has only a finite amount of memory, eventually he's going to have to erase. And so we have to, ask, have to ask the question, what is the thermodynamic cost of erasure?
Now, this was a question which was actually asked by Ralph Landauer in the early 60s, and his answer was that erasing a bit requires work. amount of work, which is at least kt log 2. Log 2 because we're, erase, we're erasing one bit. Okay. So if Lindo is right about that, then there's really um, no paradox. If we want to really have a closed cycle, and we want to put the demon's memory as well as the box where back where it started, then we're going to have to uh, pay back the K log 2 of entropy that we withdrew from the reservoir during the erasure. The erasure itself will be a dissipative process. It will dissipate heat. Entropy will go back to the reservoir. Everything is back where it started, but we got no useful work out net because the work that we did using the one molecule gas, we had to pay back when we erased the demon's memory. Okay, so the question is why? This is called Landauer's Principle. Stated in 1961. So this guy delivered all the Well, he didn't uh, specifically discuss. Uh, Maxwell's demon. Landauer's main point was that was was quite interesting, um, and I'll come back to that at the end if we have time, which maybe we won't. So maybe I should say it now. He worked for IBM, okay, and his job was to think about computing, and he said that there's a thermodynamic cost to computing, which is unavoidable because when you compute, you necessarily erase information, because logic gates are not logically reversible in general. They can destroy information. He said that it would cost about uh, kT in energy each time you do a gate in a computer, and so you'd never be able to reduce the energy cost of computing down to zero. And that was his main point. He was wrong about that. Um, but he did state correctly that Whatever is logically irreversible has some non-zero thermodynamic cost, in particular erasure. Erasure is something that once it's done, you cannot undo. That's the sense in which it's logically reversible. His statement was that if it's logically reversible, that means it's thermodynamically reversible. But it wasn't until another 20 years later that uh, Charlie Bennett really uh, completely explained what was going on namely that Landauer's principle is the key to understanding why Maxwell's demon doesn't violate the second law. to describe Szilard's machine, I'll imagine that the demon uses a similar machine for his memory.
when Beeman wants to record a bit, he puts a molecule in the box. The box is divided into two parts. He either puts a molecule on the left side, uh, let's say the right side, and he calls that uh, storing a zero, or he puts the molecule on the left side, and he calls that And if he's doing this uh, solar cycle many times, each time he stores another molecule in the box to keep track of the information, which he's got to have on hand when he loads the partition, was it on the left side or the right side? Okay. So I'm using the box two ways. I'm using it as the object that is um, running a heat engine cycle, but I'm also using it as the memory, another box, which I can use to record information. And now, after I've done this many times, I've got lots of molecules in boxes, each one stored on the left or the right. Okay. Therefore, the cycle isn't closed. Every time I ran the cycle, I sort of another bit. Eventually, I want to erase all the bits. How do you erase a bit? Well, in this case, I have to do something, some physical process, which, irrespective of whether the initial recorded value was zero or one, will take the bit to the same final value. Give me a zero, irrespective of whether I had a zero or a one to begin with. So that's what erasure is. It's a math. from a bit to a bit. And no matter whether the bit is originally 0 or 1, it maps it to the same value. Let's call that 0. Okay. So when I say it's irreversible, I mean this is not an invertible map. If you know the output of the erasure, um, namely 0, you don't know whether it was initially a 0 or a 1. They both got mapped to the same value. So non-invertible map. I call that logically irreversible. You can't undo it. So how do I erase that information? I've got to do something like this. No matter whether the molecule was on the right or the left um, initially, I have to make sure it's on the right finally. Okay. Well, here's a way you can do the erasure, and the analysis would apply no matter how you do it. Here's an erasure procedure. Erasure means that I have a way of storing a zero or a one, and no matter how it was stored to begin with, I want to have a zero at the end. Okay. And I have to apply a procedure which works the same way, no matter whether it was a zero or a one to begin with, because it would work differently depending on whether it was a zero or a one to begin with, I would have to record that information. Um, can't you just remove the partition? Well, I could remove the partition, but then that will not take the memory back to its um, original configuration. I won't know whether it's a zero or a one. If I say that the zero state is uh, the state where it's on the right side, and the one is the state where, where it's on the left side, if I just remove partition, Now it's neither on the left or the right, it's bouncing around. Okay. So I can try to force it to be on the left or the right. And in fact, I can't just put the partition back because that would just, I wind up with a random bit. It might be over here or it might be over here. Okay. So I want to do something which will make sure that it's always on the right no matter what. So what should I do? 
And what I should do is compress the gas. Right? So I start out with a movable wall way over here on the left. The molecule is somewhere in the box. I'm in contact with a reservoir, temperature top. And I compress. And let's see statically, little by little, partly compressed here. When I'm done compressing, the wall is in the middle again, and it's guaranteed that the molecule is on the right side. When I did the compression, I had to do work. I was actually reducing the entropy of the um, molecule, reducing the volume that it occupies from the final volume 2 to the initial volume 1. So the amount of entropy Entropy of gas are reduced under uh, isothermal compression by K log two because the final volume is half of the initial volume. So, where does that entropy go? Well, where does it go? It goes back to the reservoir, right? So there's going to be, because I'm compressing, I'm doing work on the gas, but it stays at temperature top. So there's going to be heat flow from the gas back to the reservoir. So, uh, W equals uh, K T log 2 is work done. Hence, heat flow at the reservoir. So, the entropy of reservoir um, increases. to do work KT log 2, energy KT log 2 that I drew from the reservoir, but it wasn't a closed cycle, because I wound up with a bit stored in the demon's memory. To get a really close cycle, I've got to erase that bit. The erasure of the bit, though, is a dissipated process. It sends, when it's done as reversibly as possible, entropy K log 2 back to the reservoir, and it requires that we do work, KT log 2. The general principle is that erasure is a procedure that compresses the phase space, reduces the number of possible states of the system. Right? That's what we mean by erasure. If we have a bit, it means there are two possible states. The molecule could be here or here. When we erase, no matter what, we want it to be here. So here there are two states. Here there's only one. We've lost one bit of information, and so we reduce the entropy by k log 2, and there's no way we can get around it. So that's the resolution. We have to, it's a little bit uh, surprising when you first hear it, because you think that remembering things is hard, you know, and studying for an exam, and forgetting things is easy, but it's actually the other way around. It doesn't cost any energy to remember something, but it costs KT log 2 to for forget a bit. Okay? So if you work really hard, you can forget everything I told you. <laughs> and it's hard. In 10 years or so, um, you'll have successfully done so. 